let her fly. But uh, nevertheless, God's good. Well, I sure enjoyed being here with you folks. What a joy. Good to see the good number. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you, Pastor. Appreciate his love for the Lord. I appreciate what he's doing. Uh, I wouldn't want to be doing that. I mean, uh, I'm glad God called him for that, not me. I'd enjoy the traveling, uh, but man, uh, back and forth and all the strain and so forth and so on. And I know a little bit about that. And of course, uh, I pray for him, and I know you pray, and we're praying for the work here. I appreciate these churches that we have in our area. Church, you just don't know how blessed you are living in this area. I mean, we've got a number of good churches, really. I mean, you, you hear things all the time, you know. You hear things about a church and this and that and so forth and so on. And, uh, uh, you know, bad things. People always coming up with something bad. And churches have problems. Uh, I mean, every church has problems. The devil's going to see to that. Uh, I mean, if the devil's not fighting, uh, they're not doing anything for the Lord. Uh, where a church is really trying to uh, do something for the Lord, they, they'll have some problems, but God always is the problem sovereign. He takes care of the problems, meets the need as we pray and seek his will. And I appreciate this church and your stand and your love and your faithfulness and just a real joy to be back with you. It's been some time since I've been here. It's not that there was any dispute between your preacher and I. It's just that every time he called me, I was scheduled somewhere else, you know, and or I'd either be in Florida or one or the other. And he'd say, well, uh, preacher said, we'll get you on the next trip. And he'd try again. But anyway, I'm glad I was open today and had the opportunity to come. It's been a joy to be with you, and I appreciate you, love you, and thank God for you. And I want you to know we pray for you, pray for all these churches, and we're so excited about what God's doing in this area. We have a number of good fundamental churches in the Montgomery County area in Pulaski, and we praise the Lord for that. And Salem, I preach a lot down in Salem. Good church is there, and I thank God for that. Well, have your Bibles this morning. Turn with me to the book of Philippians, if you will. Uh, I said Philippians, the book of Acts. Uh, let's go to the book of Acts. Uh, and get my mind straight and in gear this morning and uh, get back to where we're at. I want to I wanna speak to you today on Philip's trip to the desert. I tell you what, I love Philip. I think he was a, a tremendous servant of God. Uh, he doesn't shine like uh, maybe a lot of the others uh, uh, men did, but yet he has a real testimony for the glory of God. God greatly used him, honored and blessed him, and and I think we can, can glean from this and uh, get some truths that will help us and encourage us and strengthen us and uh, uh, draw us closer to the Lord. If you go to go with me to the book of Acts chapter 8 and go down to verse 26, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south. I like that, don't you? Then say north, said south. Under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went and beheld a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me, and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. 
And then in Isaiah 53, 3 to 6, these are the words. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation and his judgment, was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? For the life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and I love this, and he began at the same scripture, and he preached unto him Jesus. And so they went on their way. They came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth it hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, Thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I want us to think this morning on Philip's trip to the desert. Let's pray. Father, we sure thank you for the privilege to be here with these folks today. Boy, thank you for the good number we've got that's come out. And I pray you'll bless each one. I know they've put forth an effort to be here. And Lord, most likely there are some here that don't feel like being out, but they love you and they want to be in your house. And yet I pray you'll bless every one of us today. You'll strengthen our hearts. You'll encourage us. You'll draw us closer to you, but you'll give us that hunger, that thirst to serve you, to be faithful unto you to be used for your glory, to bring honor and praise to your name. And if there's someone here not saved today, Lord, may they see their need of Jesus. May they respond and say, yes, they know to Satan, Lord. Defeat the devil and may you be victorious. Draw our hearts closer to you. May we as your children just sell out to you today and be used for your glory. And we'll praise you in Christ's name for his sake. Amen. Now we find that Philip was having a great, great revival meeting to speak of. In other words, we know that Philip was a member of the first church there in Jerusalem. And most likely he had been in one of the services and where Peter had been preaching and probably had stirred the people up about soul winning and told them of the importance of being out in the community and and visiting and knocking on doors and ringing doorbells for Jesus and sharing the gospel and passing out gospel tracts and just being on fire for the Lord. And so we find that Philip caught that fire. And Philip goes to the upper part of Jerusalem into the neighborhood and begins to spread the good news of the saving grace of our Savior. I can see Philip there now as he was going from house to house, door to door. He was witnessing, telling folks about Christ. Most likely he was having probably street meetings, you know, and, and getting the crowd around and standing and preaching and proclaiming the word of God. I mean, he was having the time of his life. He was seeing people saved. He was seeing folks come Trust Christ as Lord and Savior. And man, you, you've maybe been in services like that where the power of God's Spirit moves and hearts are stirred and, and boy, if people are coming to the altar and getting saved and testifying and uh, just an outpouring of God's Spirit. That's what he was witnessing. He was seeing. He was in that kind of meeting. Now, I don't know about you, but... I've been in some church meetings that I hate to see come to a close. I've been in some revivals that I hated to see the evangelist leave, you know. He had to go somewhere else, and I wanted to go on and on and on because it was 
so sweet and so precious and the preaching was so great. But yet it comes to a close. And so we find that Philip here having a great, great campaign, great meeting, and all of a sudden an angel appears to him and says, Philip, God wants you to go down to the desert. Of all places to go to a desert. Can you imagine that? And of course, Philip didn't hesitate. Philip didn't question. Philip didn't ask anything. Philip just did exactly what that angel said. To listen to God. To go to the desert. Now I don't know about you. But I'm not sure I could have done that. I'm afraid I would have stood there and argued with that angel. And said now look. It looks to me that I'm having. I mean you look at folks that are being saved. And we're getting folks right with God. And we've got an outpouring of God's spirit. You think God really wants me to leave? Philip didn't do that. He was willing. Now get this. He was willing to do exactly what God wanted him to do. He was willing to follow the Lord. He, he wouldn't question. He, he didn't question. He was willing to just do what God said do. And so Philip did exactly as God told him to do through the angel. He went down to the desert. Now notice what happened when he got down to the desert. You go to verse, thir verse 27, and you find that Philip actually could be said as a willing servant. He was willing to go. In other words, he was willing to be led by God's Spirit. Now, church, that's where our willingness ought to come in. If you're saved this morning by the grace of God, born in the family of God, heaven's your home, you ought to be a willing servant. And that doesn't mean that God's going to lead you to the desert or God's going to lead you to Brazil or God's going to lead you uh, to Israel. God's going to lead you uh, to Canada, some other place. No, but we ought to be willing to go if God does. Wherever God wants us to go, whatever God wants us to do, we ought to be willing to do it. The little things in our neighborhood that God wants us to do. The people that God wants us to visit or pass out a gospel tract to or to speak to or to share the gospel with. We ought to have every day that willing spirit to be willing to be led by God's Holy Spirit. We look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. And the Bible tells us those that are led, willing to follow the Spirit, they are known as the children of God. Why is it we're not known as God's children? Why is it that we have to tell people that we're saved? Listen, our lives ought to demonstrate the salvation that's within we ought to live so godly, so much like the Lord, that the beauty of Christ would be seen in us and folks could take notice that we've been with Jesus. My wife and I, we went to Cairo, Egypt. We went in a perfume factory. And when we come out, we didn't have to tell anybody where we'd been. Everybody outside turned their nose up, walked off, smelling that perfume. They knew exactly. That ought to be our lives as God's children. Folks ought to see the beauty of Christ in us and have a hunger and a desire to know the Jesus that we know. And so we find that we need to be willing servants to be led by God's Spirit that people can see Christ in us. We need to be, uh, we need to be willing to serve God wherever God wants us to go. Not our decisions, not our desire. Now it's easy, uh, you, you know, to pick out places to go visit. But we ought to be just open. I, I know there have been times in my life that God's moved on my heart to go to a certain place. And I, I'll be honest, I have to be honest, I argued with God. Never will forget on one occasion, I was leaving the house to go to the hospital. And I had to go to Radford Hospital, and then from there go back to Roanoke. That's back when, you know, they were using, of course, they're still doing that. But anyway, it was really bad back then. And, 
and and just like seemed like every day it was back and forth and and uh, and I had a, a just a, a, a telephone call about a pastor that had just had a problem and God was motivating my heart to go by and see him and I was arguing with God God I don't have time for that I mean I wasn't coming out just saying that but that's exactly how I was feeling you know and I was in that old car headed for Radford and of course when I got there to a certain street I said well I better go by and I turned and I went and I found that pastor in terrible shape or oh, he had gone through a terrible situation and he was defeated and quitting and on the verge of just throwing in the town and God used me to uh, see that guy get his heart back in tune with God get back involved and uh, get back in the ministry and greatly used for the glory of God now that's what I'm talking about we need to be open to be led by the Spirit of God to let God speak to our hearts and to be open in spirituality that we're willing to serve where God wants us to serve. Remember, that was Isaiah. Isaiah, when, uh, when the king said, uh, when God said, who shall I send? Who will go? Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. I'll go. Send me. Send me. He volunteered. That ought to be us. Then notice something else about Philip. He was willing here to help someone in need. Oh, my, a lot of folks are in need. Are we willing to help? Are we willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to give? It's not easy today, but yet that's God's desire for us to show forth Christianity, to be that for Galatians 6.10 tells us so clearly that therefore opportunity avails itself. We need to show the help and do the help. So Philip was a willing servant. He was willing to go, willing to serve. Boy, we should be. We ought to ask God to help us have that kind of spirit, that kind of desire. But notice what happened now, because he was a willing servant, and he went down to the desert. Of all places to go to, a desert. Folks just don't go to the desert. I mean, it's hot. I mean, it's no fun. There's just no place to live. No desire to be there. You can't raise crops, uh, so forth, so on. But yet, God led Philip to go down to the desert. And notice what happens as he gets there. We find in verses 27 to 37 now, he has the opportunity of speaking to a wandering sinner. Here is an Ethiopian man. He's come down from Ethiopia which is above uh, Jerusalem in, in another country, and he's come down to Jerusalem to a religious service, sort of like some of the services we have around, you know, where uh, they have uh, these, uh, ex these services of excitement and thrill and emotional. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in anything like that or not, Everybody gets excited, hoop, holler, carry on, have a great time. And then when it's over, they walk out the door and their chins are dragging the ground. They're sadder than they were when they went in. Uh, nothing to carry with them. And that's what he got into, that kind of situation. And he spent a week there in, in just trying to find what he was looking for. He knew he was lost or something was wrong. He was miserable. He was a miserable man. He needed help. And so we find that he was a man worshiping just as a lost man worships. He was going to the wrong places. You look at verse 27, and he went through his own desires and what he thought, but he couldn't understand. In verses 30, the Bible said he had no understanding of God's word. Church, we need to realize the sinner doesn't understand the word of God. They don't understand why you come to church on Sunday morning, used to Sunday night, Wednesday night, 
revival meetings. They don't understand why you read your Bible, why you spend so much time in prayer. They don't understand that. But they need to know the reason. And they need to know why you do it. And wherein this man had no understanding of what he was reading. In other words, we, uh, we pass out tracts, and that's good. And I, I pass out tracts all the time. Got a pocket right here full of tracts. Hope to give them all out here for long. But wait a minute. The track just doesn't do the job. Now, folks can get saved reading that track. It's got the gospel on it. It's clear-cut gospel. But more than just them reading it, they need someone that shares the word of God with them. You find that majority of people that are genuinely saved, and when you got saved, most likely someone shared the word with you, maybe in a church or in your home. And they took the word of God and showed you God's plan. That's what we need to have that burden of concern with our neighbors and our friends to uh, share the word with them, to tell them what Jesus has done for us. I think of the little boy that was sort of retarded and he couldn't read or write. He got gloriously saved. He had the preacher to mark all of the uh, scriptures there in Romans on salvation. He'd go down to the uh, post office, stand outside where folks would come, and he'd catch somebody and ask them to read, and he'd show them Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And they'd read it to him, and he'd look up at him and said, wouldn't you like to do that? Wouldn't you like to trust Christ? He showed them salvation. And week after week, he would bring people to church on Sunday morning that he had led to the Lord there and couldn't even read himself. But he shared the word of God. Church, what I'm saying is this man needed somebody to show him the word of God. And so God sent Philip down to the desert and here this man that is a great man, a great uh, orator to speak of, got a great position. He's working for the queen. She sends him down to hear the word, but he doesn't get it. He's on his way back home, and he's reading the word of God. And Philip comes and shares the word with him. Now, notice the Bible tells us they had a desire to hear more of the word. I can see old Philip now, can't you? Philip run up beside of that, uh, beside of that uh, chariot and he heard the man as he was reading and he said, you understand what you read? And that man looks down and says, no, how can I unless somebody tells me? Would you get up, in the, up in, uh, with me and share with me and tell me? And Philip does. And Philip gets up and notice what he gives him. He gives him Isaiah. If you turn over to the book of Isaiah 53 and start reading, you'd read the same thing that Philip shared right here with that man. He shared the gospel. He told him about what Christ did on the cross and what Christ did for him and shared how he could be gloriously saved and born into the family of God and come to know Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And as Philip shared the word with him, this man's heart was moved and was broken, and he realized his need, and thank God he responded and received. You say, preacher, how do you know it? Now go on and read on. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, preaching unto him Jesus. He preached Jesus to him. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doeth hinder me to be baptized? Now, a lot of folks think baptism saves. But baptism can't wash away any sins. There's no power in water to 
take away our sin. In fact, water don't even wash away dirt. You got to put soap with it, you know, to get that dirt off of you and uh, get cleaned up and smell right, get a little smell from it. And so there's that need. But yet baptism doesn't say baptism is a picture of what God's already done in your heart. You're saved, born again in the family of God. You've died with Christ. You've been buried. You've resurrected to a new life. But he said, here's water. Let me get baptized. And, and uh, notice what Philip said. Philip didn't stop there. He didn't say, okay, yeah, great. Here's water. Boy, let's get excited. You know, a lot, a lot of preachers do that. You know, somebody walks out and makes a profession and uh, they want to get baptized and they baptize them. And the person made a profession, but they didn't make a possession. You say, well, what happened, preacher? They didn't really open their hearts and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. We have a lot of professions made in our churches. I had a few at Gateway. And uh, we wonder why in the world people, uh, you know, fade out in a few months or a few weeks or a few days. It's because they didn't make a real possession. They, uh, they just went through the emotion uh, you know, something happened, tragedy took place. Uh, somebody had a car wreck, somebody had sickness. I had one boy in my neighborhood I stayed after, and if I'd mentioned his name, you'd probably know him. And uh, especially know his family. Uh, uh, they were the uh, bootleggers of Luster's Gate for years. And, and, uh, and I'd... I'd witnessed to him, I'd pleaded with him, I'd begged him about salvation. And uh, he's just nice as he could be to me, but he wouldn't come to church, he wouldn't respond. He got sick. I went over to the hospital, and he said, Preacher, they tell me I'm going to die, that they can't do anything for me. And uh, I said, You need to get saved before you die. And he said, That's what I want to do. I want to, how do I do it? And I went through the plan of salvation, and he prayed, prayed the prayer. And I thought, sure, he meant business. And, and, um, and I told him, I said, now, I'm praying God, God heals you, raises you up. But if he don't, just thank God when you die, you'll be in heaven. You'll be with the Lord. And that'd be far better off than being here. And how true that is. And, and he looked at me and said, that'd be great. I, I accept that. And they came back in and told him that they had diagnosed him with the wrong fella. He didn't have that disease. The other fella that had it, not him, he was okay. And they sent him home. He never came to church. I went to see him. You know what he told me? He said, oh, I don't need the Lord now. I'm not dying. Now, you know what happened? He made a false profession. He didn't really mean business with the Lord. And when you mean business, your life will be changed. And it'll be more than baptism. And Philip turned and looked at this man in verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with what? All of thine heart. Not just some of it, part of it. But if you'll open your heart, really admit you're lost and cannot save yourself. You have no power to redeem yourself. But if you'll invite Christ in to become your Lord and your Savior, he becomes the master of your life, the king of your life, then you can be born again into the family of God. And that man said, I've done that. Philip said, I'll baptize you. And Philip baptized him. Isn't that precious? Isn't that wonderful? Here's a man that was lost on the road to a devil's hell without Christ, and God sent Philip. I wonder who God sended you to. I wonder who God wants you to speak to, even maybe today or this week, or who will come into your contact that you will have opportunity. Or I wonder too, if maybe someone's here that's never trusted Christ. You've never really accepted him as Lord and Savior. You might say I've uh, been a Christian all my life, but 
To be honest, preacher, I really didn't admit that I was lost. I was hell deserving. I deserved hell. Every one of us do and still do. But thank God for forgiveness of cleansing of the blood that takes away the guilt of sin, puts our name in the Lamb's book of life. Do you know the Lord today? Do you know him as Savior? Do you know if you die right now, heaven would be your home? Folks, I tell you, I'd be scared to leave this building without knowing that my sins are forgiven. My name's written in the Lamb's book of life. The greatest joy of my life, and I've had some great joys. I had the great joy of pastoring a great church, wonderful church, glorious church, seen a tremendous work established by the power of God, tremendous school, great school. God blessed richly while we were there, and I thank God for it and praise him. But I want to tell you, it's not as great as the day that I got saved. Greatest day of my life is the day that I was born again by the Spirit of God into the family of God. I thank God for marriage. I thank God for my mother that went down through the jaws of death. All of that's precious to me, but nothing is as precious as that day that Jesus reached down Cleansed my heart of the guilt of sin. Wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. And I know right now, if I would fall over dead, I'd be more alive than I've ever been in all of my life. I'd be home with the Lord. Do you know that? This man did. Why? Because he listened to the preacher and he accepted what he was told. And folks, if you know it, we need to share it. We need to let others know it. And they need to know that it's not just going to church. See, that's what the devil's tricked us up on. So many people have the idea now it's just joining the church or it's getting your name written down. But it needs to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And it only comes through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't been washed in the blood, you're not saved. Only the blood can cleanse. Water can't do it. Baptism never will do it. But it's the blood. Do you know it? If you don't, you ought to receive him. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I wonder if there's someone here this morning they would just be honest and say, Preacher, I thought I was saved. I've, I've been thinking, but to be honest, I realize that I've never really repented of my sins. I've never really opened my heart and trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. But I'm concerned. I know I need to. I need to be saved. Would you slip your hand up? I'd like to pray for you. There's nothing like prayer, the power of prayer. Anyone like that? I trust everybody here is saved today. And I feel that everybody probably is, but maybe someone's not. And I wouldn't want to leave without giving you opportunity to settle that. Would you do it? Let me ask you this then. You'd say, preacher, I'm saved. But I'll be honest, I haven't been the witness that I ought to be. I don't have the boldness like Philip had, and I understand that. A lot of people's not like me. I go into a place I can talk to anybody and everybody, and no matter who they are, no problem. Others can't do that, and I understand that. But you can pass out a track. You can leave a track. You can send a letter, a card. You can call someone on the telephone, invite them to church. See what I'm saying? Let's just be stirred up today. Let's say, you know, we're living in the last days. Things are getting bad, rough. And if the Lord comes, my 
loved ones that are not saved, they're going to be left behind. They need to get saved. My neighbors that are not saved, I, I love them. They're, they're, they're so good to me, but uh, I'd hate to leave them behind. See what I'm saying? Let's grab that burden today. Let's be like old Philip. Let's just start being that witness testimony and just have the time of our life serving the Lord. Would you do it? Would you do it? God help you. Father, I pray you'll speak to every one of us today. Lord, we need to be a Philip today. Lord, we sure do need to be busy serving you. Lord, we do really, really need to shine for your glory. And there's a lot of Ethiopians, Lord, that's traveling. There's a lot of people that are not saved, especially in our neighborhood. I think so often of the college and uh, what a need there. But God help us to shine for your glory. And we can lay tracks out that those college kids might pick up. Might not, but they still have the opportunity. And if they don't, if we don't lay them out, they don't have the opportunity. Lord, help us to be faithful serving you and doing it. Continue to bless this church. Bless the pastor. Keep him safe and bring him home safely. Give us a good day and we'll praise in Christ's name for his sake. Amen.